I've always wanted to begin a presentation with this. If you allow me, book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And then God said, let there be Danny Meyer. I think there was... <laughs> and I have no idea how many times today that Danny has been referenced, but he, for me, I am a Canadian. Thank you very much. In Canada, you say, Wayne, you're only talking about one guy. In our world, we say Danny, and we know we're only talking about one guy. But from Danny Meyer, where I learn the majority of my stuff, it seems that he's been here since the beginning. <laughs> one other thing that has been here since the beginning is wine. And the beautiful thing is, I shit you not. <laughs> Book of Genesis, chapter 9, verse 20. Noah was the first tiller of the soil. He was a man of the soil. He planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine. He became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. <laughs> so, I will not reenact that today, but we'll save that for next year's welcome. So, I am honored to be with you today, and you can tell from this little ditty that the focus of my speech will involve beverage and wine specifically. I'm still at odds as to why Will and Anthony invited me here today, as Gabe said earlier, with such august people in this room, why little old me? Uh, it took me about two months to submit an idea for a, uh, a speech, uh, but when I sent along tension plus conflict plus mom's advice equals hospitality, um, Will said rock and roll with no direction beyond that. I was <laughs> sweating, desperate, trying to think of what everyone else was going to say, and I thought, well, I'm going to add something with just a little zinger to the side. My subtitle for the speech perchance they did not accept that title, was everything I learned about hospitality I learned from driving a Zamboni, just because I wanted to stand up here and say, Zamboni. But anyway. So, tension. Uh, a 16th century French medical term that literally means to stretch a body. But the definition that we will use today is the relationship between ideas with conflicting implications. Confrontation from the Latin, confrontare, combination of with and front. And back then it used to mean or reference two people who would stand forehead to forehead. But for our definition today, we will say that it's standing face to face with a hostile or argumentative intent. And I will say to the gentleman who kindly introduced me today, tension and conflict so describe my time managing Robert Bohr at Gramercy <laughs> Tavern. <laughs> Regardless of what he has achieved in our industry, he is the most tension-filled, confrontational person on the goddamn planet. But we <laughs> love that. And then there's my mom who you will get to know a little bit later on. I guess the subtitle, after the Zamboni subtitle, could be, if you would allow it, no plus no plus yes equals hospitality. And I would presume today the word no has not been used very much because we in this room are all about Yes, as Danny taught me way back when, when I started working at Gramercy Tavern in 1995, in practicing so-called aggressive hospitality, it's aggressive because we always say yes, and always saying yes puts us in interesting situations. Now, this morning, we heard from the Canlis brothers. Awesome presentation. I wish I could jump on a stool so deftly. And if those two guys gave that speech to the Netherlands at halftime and they came out and scored four unbelievable goals, I applaud them and I want to them to come and speak 
to my staff, to Rita Jamais, the code of hospitality, born into this industry, her husband literally born in this goddamn business, rock and roll. Simon King so practiced hospitality that Anthony's first thing he did the following morning was wake up and laugh. What the hell did Simon King do that night that caused <laughs> Anthony to do that? And then Gabe. I was lucky enough that Gabe actually worked at Hearth Restaurant. We called Gabe Gabby G back in those days. <laughs> and I vividly remember, I didn't see him at home dressing, but when he came in, he was like putting his collar up, pulling his jacket taut, riding that pink bike you said earlier, yeah? Uh, coming in, handing me his iPod and saying, play this goddamn tune for me tonight. Um, he drank a shit ton of coffee. I didn't... <laughs> It really didn't, I, I don't know, I'm addicted to caffeine, but goddamn him, Jesus, it was unbelievable back then. And look what Gabe has gone on to do today. And then there is me. If there was a Golgotha of hospitality, the three crosses, based at least on the title of my speech today, might be occupied by the gentleman at the wedding of Cana, who didn't bring enough wine, and then we had to bring in someone else to take care of that. The beverage director at the Hotel Fontainebleau at the LIV Club, who didn't buy enough Ace, Ace of Spades for the Miami Heat to celebrate with, <laughs> and me. But I am happy to occupy that mantle, if you so kindly give it to me. Oop. Now, a little background on me. I was born in the hospitality business. My grandfather and father opened a restaurant in 1961 in Toronto, Canada called La Scala. It was Canada's first formal Italian restaurant. My earliest memories of youth were of going there on Saturdays, polishing glassware, setting tables, ironing tabletops, vacuuming floors, dusting lampshades, on and on you go. Um, I loved it. I loved working with my father, my grandfather, my grandmother, my mother. It was what I thought was my life up until my early teenage years. And then in my early teenage years, while my peers were listening to Elton John, I started to listen to the Bay City Rollers. Um, while my friends were listening to Bob Seeger, I started listening to The Clash and Gary Newman. So I had this hospitality background, and I coupled it with this alternative thing I loved these things that were not getting what I thought was proper due in the marketplace. Um, one might say when I went to the University of Toronto and after four years of not so studious studying, I was asked to leave because of my focus on hospitality. Um, my father sent me to Italy for 28 days. And compared to the staff of my restaurant, um, I went over there a relative ignoramus, and I came back a relative genius. Um, and it wasn't in exactly what I learned about wine per se, it was in the experiences that I had that I fell in love with this beverage, that I saw in this beverage everything that I wanted to do at university but so miserably failed. I saw in wine religion, we've already referenced that. I saw in it philosophy, I saw in it culture, civilization, et cetera, et cetera. I also saw what was happening at the table. I was lucky enough on that trip because of my father's relationships that I could sit down at the table with Piero Antonori. 600 years of history behind him at this incredible palazzo in Florence. And at the same time, I'd go to Piedmont and sit at the table with a true farmer. And everyone was equal. I loved this aspect. And it was maybe a return to my roots of hospitality. And so when I got back home, I, um, I was addicted to this business of ours. And what I felt I needed to do at that point in time was tell stories. Tell stories about the things that I experienced in those 28 days. But I'm going to pause for a second. Can you raise the house lights for a moment? Rock and roll. All right, I'd like to see you. So a show of hands of those people who are not in the hospitality business who are here today. Why did you come here? <laughs> because hospitality, as was so eloquently stated earlier, 
is not just in the restaurant industry. It should be in all service industries. A show of hands of all of those people who are in this glorious world of hospitality. Sweet. Whom of you are involved in the beverage component of this thing? Sweeter. Nicely done. All right, so keep the house lights up because I like to look into your eyes when we talk. Now, upon returning home from this trip to Italy, I still had this love of Gary Newman and, uh, okay, the Bay City Rollers. They sort of fell by the wayside. But um, getting into the gothic music scene, yes, goth music for me, this darkness descended upon me. And you know what? It descended upon the wine world too. These are two wine lists. The one on the left, 1915, Ritz Carlton. The one on the right is from 2014, a restaurant in New York. And I do look at this as darkness because for all the advances that we've made in our industry, that the chefs have done back of the house, that designers have done design-wise, music, everything else that we get to be involved in, with the one thing that hasn't really bloody well changed is this. How pathetic is this, that a wine list is just a list of wine. Can it be so much more than that? But I would have to confess to you that I was guilty of committing the same goddamn sin that when I moved to New York in 1991 and worked at a bunch of places, um, most, forgive me, most importantly, Gramercy Tavern starting in 1995 and putting, starting to put together a list in 1997, I did the same goddamn thing. I committed this sin of not doing justice to these incredible beverages that were coming through our front door, that I was not being that storyteller that I had wanted to be back in the late 80s upon returning home from Italy. So finally, in 2003, in opening up Hearth Restaurant with Marco Canora, that was my opportunity, because anyone who's ever opened a joint in this place as a beverage director says to themselves, damn it, how is my list going to be different than anyone else's out there? And now, this was it. It was not going to be a list of wines. I was going to start telling stories. So where were my influences for these things? Well, the Sex Pistols. I love the Pistols, the confrontational nature, the tension involved in their music and their presentation. Was anyone alive in 1978, January 14th, San Francisco, and saw the final show? Please tell me someone was here at that show. Someone stick up their hand just to make me feel better. There you go, right there. Will Gadara, <laughs> rock and roll. During that show, Johnny Rod knelt down on the edge of the stage and said to the audience, how does it feel to be cheated? And I love that. That has nothing to do with today, by the way. But anyway, I just love saying that <laughs> shit. But... Those guys and what they did to the music industry, whether you like them or not, the influence of the Pistols is still felt today in how the music industry and music itself goes. The Crusades! Holy shit, 1095 Pope Urban II. Under the guise of taking back the Holy Lands for the Latin Church, which was utter bullshit, let's be honest about it, ladies and gentlemen. It was a massive land grab, and it was an attempt to stem the flow of Islam west. But in these two things, I don't see any disparity. I find influence to do my wine programs. If Robert Bohr was up here, he would say the exact same goddamn thing. I guarantee it. But in these two things, I found the ability to finally be a storyteller. This is one of the wine pages that we crafted. And you can see the tension and the confrontation. Just look at the bloody title the craziest, stupidest wine ever, and you are not allowed to order it. Now, that was not dressed up for today's purposes. That was actually on my wine list. If anyone had the, the pleasure of trying the Scolian Project 2006 Pinot Grigio titled the San Floriano del Colio, only 21 cases were made, um, you would remember this wine too because it was the craziest shit ever. Pinot Grigio that was orange with stuff floating in it. <laughs> but I loved it because it said something. It had a story to tell. But I told my staff that when someone ordered it, you had to say, no, 
you are not allowed to order this wine. <laughs> and embarrassingly, we sold our 12 bottle allocation in less than a week. What the hell am I supposed to do? So here was an overt representation of tension and confrontation. But then, you know, I had come out of the Danny Meyer world. What, how was I going to balance this out? But then I remembered mum. This is Margaret Greco. And for my father and for sons, it took me about 21 years, but I finally learned that my mum was the rock of the Greco family. And she taught me more about hospitality than anyone. Like I think most mums, always with a smile. She taught me about chivalry. As everyone watched Anthony Rudolph, a uh, six-minute speech on TEDx for chivalry, watch that goddamn thing. Simply put, how did, how, what was the first lesson? Hold the door open for mum. That was it, and it all went from there. I still have an internal conflict whether we are born with hospitality, we learn it, but for me, my mum birthed me and fused me with hospitality. And after crafting that wineless page, with the tension, with the confrontation, I had to start remembering mum a little bit more. And so the wine pages sort of changed. I lessened the conflict nature of things. So the opening line, if you can't read it, I still had to have some biblical stuff going on here, is if there is a devil in the world of German wine, then it most certainly is blue nun. And... Shout out Musar, Serge Hoshar. Opening statement, if Jesus and Satan had a son, he would be called Serge Hoshar. <laughs> Unfortunately, the son of God and the Che Guevara of angels have yet to find common ground, but I am still left with Serge Hoshar. He is my savior and my tormentor. He speaks the God's honest truth about wine, but then leads you down a path that not even a serpent could navigate. So I use these pages on my wine list to tell stories. Um, how I act tableside, still I have not fully moved away from tension and conflict. Now, how does this jibe with Danny Myers? Because I think we all abide by this. We have his book, By Our Bad Size. It is our Bible. I love his definition of hospitality versus service. Service is that monologue between me and you, you telling, or me telling you exactly what I'm going to do and when I'm going to do it, and you have no say in the matter, where hospitality is you, fine lady, telling me, your expectations and me telling you how I'm going to do this thing. So if, when I come to your table at my restaurant or wine bars, you know what my first word to you is when you ask for a wine is no. It is tension filled. It is confrontational. But as my mom taught me, that no comes with a smile. Because then I have put the onus upon myself to somehow have this conversation of hospitality with you. And by that no, followed by a good conversation, I get to tell you a story. I get to take you down a path. And in my mind, at least, I get to express hospitality in a way that few of us do. And the value add to that, though it is not the ultimate goal, is that you leave not only having a cool glass of grape juice, but you learn something. Ultimately, what we, the people in this room, are in the beverage industry, you should not be a goddamn cork puller because anyone can do that. You need to be a storyteller. And for me to tell the stories that I want to tell that I think are most poignant, a little bit of tension, a little bit of confrontation, remembering my mom's smile equals an unbelievable dose of hospitality. Cheers. <laughs>